Okay, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Let's call the General Purposes Committee meeting to order. Uh, may I have a motion on the minutes? Any discussion? All those in favor, post carried. We have the changes in provincial legislation, et cetera, about gas utilities. Uh, Peter, are you going to speak to this? Is there anything to add to your report? Add, Mr. Chair, I would only note that uh, the city solicitor is on the Zoom call as well. If there's any questions related to Should we have issues. questions? No, okay. No, in just a minute. We've got Councillor Wolf. Uh, Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Questions uh, to staff, just two, I think. Um, first off, are we able as a city to define what we mean by low carbon energy systems? And what I'm getting at is, could we define it as being all electric? Through the chair to Councilor Wolf, yes, it could be defined as uh, all electric. Um, low, low carbon tends to uh, convey that there's the base load of the energy demand is provided through renewable systems where there might be a peaking area that often uses gas um, for a certain percentage of the load. Okay, um, then um, with knowing that, I, I would like uh, to know how we can make that uh, change. I think that would give Richmond the potential to be a leader in this area. Um, the next thing I'd like to speak to, actually, can you respond to that first? To how, how could we um, make the, could that just be direction? Right well, now? and do we like want to? to? Uh, through the chair to Councilor Wolf, um, you know, I think council, staff will take direction from council. I, I, I think I'd like to understand specifically um, where the uh, low carbon versus zero carbon would pertain to. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I, we can Staff will take direction from Great. council. Thanks. My, my next uh, line of comments and the question um, is basically just, I'm just going to really briefly recap what other municipalities around us are doing or have done. Uh, and maybe that's where we can go next. I really value the report. I, I find it really uh, like leading edge, cutting edge at, at where the problem lies uh, that the province uh, and, uh, and uh, the jurisdiction beyond our control uh, has not budged, has not uh, made changes easy. So here's what some other municipalities are doing. Uh, Victoria and, and Saanich now have accelerated the implementation of the zero carbon step code. I know that's kind of coming and you could now kind of sign up for it in as of May today, uh, but they've already accelerated it to begin November 1st, uh, 2023. Uh, North Van is uh, apparently the leading within the step code model. New West uh, has mentioned that they prefer heat pumps over gas when they're working with any developments, be that um, uh, part nine of small buildings and part three of the large buildings. And then Squamish has actually reduced construction of residential developments by a third if they use natural gas. Um, so that's just some of the areas in Metro Vancouver, there's also great strides taken in Washington and California, as you piloted in the report, uh, and elsewhere. Um, so I'm, I'm just looking at where, where can Richmond find its gain uh, when it comes to what these other municipalities are doing. Do we see one of what I suggested or what one, another municipality is doing as our next step? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, um, you know, I think uh, you named some important cities doing action. I would put Richmond in that club, if not the leader of that area as well. We have very similar standards when it comes to uh, um, the building and energy step code, including incentives for zero uh, carbon buildings. Um, I, of note, in Richmond, 75% of the development is effectively occurring in city centre which would be caught by our district energy system, which is using currently low carbon with the intention of looking at zero carbon as well. So I, 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 with respect to buildings, which is I think what you're talking about, um, these, these uh, actions are in motion or already in place in Richmond. Um, it, and it doesn't necessarily pertain to the report in, in detail and the recommendations, but you know, rest assured that Richmond is also in that space. Okay, thanks. Uh, then I would like to make um, a, um, I guess, a referral uh, to staff. Uh, to, to <clears throat> what I see maybe is the, the method ahead here is to accelerate our implementation of the zero. Uh, well, let's, let's get the motion on the floor first, and then you can. the recommendation first. 
Okay, so it's moved and seconded. Now, do you want to, are you looking to refer part of this, or is this in conjunction with what's on the floor? Uh, yes, correct, uh, Mayor. The, the, I'd like in conjunction with this. I don't want to refer this back and have it changed. I want this to go ahead as, as stated uh, and dire have direction to staff uh, to have us accept Okay, exactly what is either the referral or the amendment you're proposing? That we accelerate the implementation of the zero carbon step code. Uh, November 1st. Uh, we'll ask uh, for Mr. Russell to comment on that. Uh, through the Chair to Council Wolf, um, the this, this standards, the same standards in the zero step code are in part nine buildings, so single detached and, and townhouse. So that's in action already today in Richmond legislation. Knowing that it was coming, we had the ability to put it in last year. And for 2023, it is in our work plan to look at the same for the larger uh, concrete and multifamily buildings. Part three. Okay, so that, that amendment has been proposed. Is there a seconder? All right, there's no seconder. So we'll go to Councillor Day. Thank you. Um, I was reading on page um, GP18 uh, about the, the decision by Madam Justice Sanders. Um, how many, I mean, this seems like a tug of war between the BC, um, Carol, is it here? BC Utilities Commission and the City of Richmond on who is the overriding controller, if you want to say, or, or of um, the, like things like the Lulu Island Energy Corp and whatnot. And uh, how many court cases have there been? How many appeals? And, and have we won um, any of them? That, if it's legal advice, we go into closed on that. But it, the, the report from Justice Saunders is in this. It's on right. page 18. So right. just but you're asking for all kinds of advice surrounding that. So if we can call a closed meeting, that's all right, to determine that. But we're not doing that in open. All right, then I'll have to wait to ask. Thanks. Councilor McNulty. Yeah, th thank you, Worship. Just quickly, a very good report. Thank you. I support everything you've done yet. I just uh, <clears throat> want to be very clear on the recommendations uh, versus uh, the actions of, of Richmond. We are recommending to the province um, for regulation and the urgent need of regulations of admission, uh, emissions and, and uh, the best practices. That doesn't prevent us from continuing on our own in the area that we're already leading in. And uh, you may use the term, I quote you, actions are in place in, already in Richmond. So we're already doing some things that the province may be behind us, in other words. Um, are we going to let the province know what we're doing already in part of that letter to say, hey, we're already doing this. We're, on, we're four steps down the road. You guys are still ready to implemented but it's not what I'm reading in there yeah, through the, the chair that would be the case we'd certainly highlight our current activities and and planned for that matter I think it's extremely important as it was quoted some of the other communities but we're still ahead so anyhow good job thank you very much all right uh, with that we're going to call the we're going to call the question on the motion all those in favor Aye. any opposed that is carried uh, brings us to the truth and reconciliation update um, uh, Jason Keita, is there anything to add to your report? Nothing to add to the report, Mr. Chair. So you've recommended that we receive this for information, but if, it, if in fact we want staff to go ahead as, as per the report, we would then, the motion would be to endorse or approve the approach that's in that report. That's correct. Yeah, okay. Okay, we've got a couple of speakers. Uh, Councillor Wolf. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a couple of questions first, and then I'll express my interest in a motion. Uh, first off, I know it's not in here, but do we are we already working on plans, regardless of hiring a manager or not, uh, for the next uh, National Day of Truth and Reconciliation? So through the chair to Councillor Wolf. We are, uh, we, we do know that we are, will celebrate uh, September 30th, uh, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, staff are currently looking at uh, an initiative uh, and what that could look like as far as a, um, if it's a uh, recognition event to, um, to recognize that day. Thanks, a follow up on that. Do we have, do we have, know if the timeline will work to have the flagpole installed in the 
flag up by then? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, the flag policy will be coming forward to Council um, in May, and that indicates uh, uh, us to, um, that will prompt us to direct us to install a flagpole, and that flagpole will be installed by September 30th. Correct. Thank you. Uh, my next uh, question uh, is in regards to the brand new website. If people haven't checked it out yet, go to richmond.ca. It's a new look, very fresh. Um, could we, now that we have this new website, could we not put the language on there relating to land acknowledgement? No. No. That is our legal advice. Oh. No. And while we're at it, on the flag, the flagpole, hasn't direction been given to you, uh, to staff, from council? Uh, to, to the chair, that's correct. The, uh, so we don't need to have anything coming back in May on that? No, the policy, it will be a policy that will come forward for council to endorse. I thought we already did that. Uh, not the, uh, you uh, provided, council provided direction to staff to include uh, banner, organizational banners within the policy. We have, not, we have yet to bring that policy back in full to back to council. All right, so that's coming in May. Correct. Okay, but I don't, the flagpole itself, I think you've got your direction. Um, yes. Up it goes. Yes. Council so, Yes, thank you. The last, uh, I guess, just comment then is uh, I, I support more than uh, just receiving this for information. I do support the hiring of the uh, manager of Indigenous relations, which will allow us to meet the calls to action that have been identified by staff in this report in attachment three, uh, which includes, I'll just read, uh, I won't read out the whole thing, um, but it includes the calls to action on page 45, 46, and 47. Those are ones that are, what would be, that would not be able uh, to be completed with the existing uh, resources. So I guess my, my last kind of question tied to that is if we hire the man manager, so I'm just missing where the uh, amount was, 150000 or something, um, does that include um, the, the staffing, um, the, to, to staff the person, but also the programming related to these, um, the ones mentioned in the attachment three that would be possible because we have the manager? Does that funding at all in, include that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, the funding would include uh, an additional resource, which would develop, which that resource would develop a plan to um, how uh, a plan to uh, a framework on how the city can uh, proceed with supporting truth and reconciliation in Richmond. Um, it, it would not include implementation of the plan, but it will identify um, specific um, elements of what what. Uh, the city could do. So it's a plan that th that could be developed. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McNulty. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, and thank you for the report. Obviously, a lot of work has gone in here. I just want to follow up on uh, on uh, the, the potential uh, uh, position that uh, we've got. I think uh, you've outlined exa uh, the various things that we are doing already, and uh, we're, we're leading. And, but in terms of the financial conditions, you want 100, we want 154.5. Um, where does this position fit in the hierarchy and who, who does this person report to? Um, do, do we have budget for office space? Uh, and following up along the line, do we have budget for uh, programming, uh, program, I mean, all the other things that might uh, take place during the year given uh, uh, the various areas that you've identified in the uh, attachments. Uh, through the I chair, mean, it's a lot more than 154. I, I look at it, it's more like 300,000. Through the chair to Council McNulty, the um, the hiring of the additional resource will, will put together a plan. So the additional resource will put together the plan. Once that plan is, is um, developed, uh, implementation of the plan will um, we will provide information on how the implementation can be rolled out. If there's additional resources that are required to do that, then, then we will bring that forward to council. Um, so the additional resource, the 154 that we identified, is just to put together a, a plan, a framework for the city, not for implementation. Okay. okay. Um, I th I'd like us to, to go with some direction, if I could, through your worship. Um, on this, I, I will support the report. 
uh, but I think we have to go one step further uh, today to give uh, specific direction. Uh, receiving for information is fine. That's great. And uh, no, no criticism. But I think we have to give direction to get the full picture. Um, I don't think we're doing enough. Uh, if you wish, I, it, uh, as uh, has been said, we're going to get some stuff down the road, et cetera. So uh, my, my thought on the resolution is to accept it for information and give staff direction to further develop the, the process and the other things that are required to make this a viable thing and up and operational. Isn't that what you're saying by your first bullet on page GP35 uh, to establish a work plan to guide the work of the new role and support reconciliation efforts in Richmond as a, a broad category? Isn't that what that is? Uh, to the chair, that's correct. So it will. So the, the additional resource will provide um, a work plan yeah, that will essentially that will guide on how, on how we can implement and support truth and reconciliation in our city. Right. Okay, if I just may, uh, we, we need to see that though uh, and move it along whether it would be yourself or whatever or the person who we're going to hire. And as you well know, it takes time through your worship to hire individuals and to find people and obviously the right person as well with some, uh, some guidance. Would we do any consultation with any of the First Nations um, in our discussion, we've—I mean, we've had great ambassadors like Terry Point and and uh, Mary Point and etc. Uh, on on us going along the line, as opposed to us just going out there um, um, and maybe some suggestions from them. Uh, to the chair, to Council McNulty, uh, the uh, the the. The bringing on hiring of an additional resource would be critical as a subject matter expert for, the, for our organization. Okay. That one of the key responsibilities and one of the first things that will need to happen with that role is to um, develop and, and, and maintain relationships with all of our indigenous communities, uh, First Nation groups, along with um, all of our stakeholders and partners. Um, to put together that framework. So it will be critical for um, this position to be able to liaise with all of our stakeholders and community partners, including First Nation groups. Okay, well, thank you very much. Good report. Your Worship, uh, when the time comes, I'd like us to look at that, adding to that uh, resolution. Well, for direction. Mr. Keita, I mean, you talk on page GP35 that implementation of plans and initiatives may require a combination of adjusting work plans of existing staff resources, potential requests for additional resources, and you're talking about identifying the necessary resources to advance specific actions. You also relate to the, the primary focus of this new person would be on, uh, on attachment four. So isn't that what you're saying? What has been, been yeah. raised? What we need is a person who can work on relationships and can work on the subject matter of, of, of implementation. And once we get a, a more defined work plan, then we can, uh, you know, through the CAO and, and whatever, we can talk about resources that are going to be needed. Uh, to the chair, that's correct. The, the resource will identify the plan. The implementation of the plan may require additional resources. And if there are additional resources required, we would bring that forward to council. All right, so we'll, we'll get an idea of the work plan as it's being, Good. well, maybe as it's developed or way farther along. Correct, we can update council. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Heed. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, I, I want to stress the importance of uh, truth and reconciliation and the importance of the 94 calls for action. Uh, as I understand from this report, I believe 16 of them pertain to local governments, and then later on you talk about 12 of them. And I believe we are looking at eight of them that uh, directly are accountable to Richmond. Is that correct, that you're suggesting? Through the chair to Councillor Heed, that's correct. A eight, we will, we will start initially start with the eight calls to action that we identified um, in the report. And um, that will be a starting point for us to be able to move forward. So, uh, Chair, uh, Metro Vancouver has 10 dedicated staff, and following up uh, with 
Councillor McNulty here on the fact that uh, we are spending $154,000 for a staff position that's going to build a report. I'm not necessarily 100% convinced, and I'm sure the CAO, she will do what's required to ensure there's accountability there. The concern I have is should we be coming up with a program first that's going to have expenditures attached to that and then look at resourcing it if in fact we have to come up with this program now you know do we have to hire a staff person or is there a consultant we can bring in which would be not hiring a hundred and fifty five thousand dollar year staff person to actually develop what we want which includes the staffing of it maybe uh, I think that's an important point. Uh, does the CAO want to comment on that? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Heat. Um, yes, certainly that was a consideration among many other approaches to this. We do feel as staff the best approach is to uh, have somebody who can be hired to work with our organization. We understand that this is a growing field uh, where resources are difficult to come by and we feel that we'll get the best expertise uh, to assist our organization by going through a hiring process and being able to hire somebody that fits with our organization our, our culture and ultimately will be part of developing the plan but also will be part of the long-term implementation we don't necessarily want to split it up where we hire a consultant that doesn't uh, uh, isn't going to be part of seeing that plan through uh, for the long term. So, uh, yep, certainly there are many approaches to this, and this is the one that we recommend at the moment. Thank you very much for that, and I certainly uh, respect that, but uh, you know the workload better than I do of your staff. Uh, we have a director of intergovernmental relations. We have a manager of intergovernment relations. I'm just not 100% there yet, Mayor, uh, to be quite frank to you, uh, Jason, is whether we need to go to another staff position at this particular time. Those are my comments. Um, well, I think that that's a, a very key question. Um, Ms. Lusk, um, if we don't get the person that you know uh, fulfills the role as we see it, then a consultant may be considered, might not? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that's certainly a possibility. And as I mentioned, the, the market is, is difficult for hiring people in many positions right now and certainly in this kind of position. So it, it, it is a possibility. Uh, but having somebody on staff who can uh, answer the many questions that we have coming from across the organization on a daily basis working with our staff to uh, make implementation plans and ultimately be part of delivering the program will serve us best in the long term. All right, so more to come on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rao. Yes, Your Worship. First of all, I'd like to thank staff for the uh, very wonderful report. And um, I think in, in some respect, we are catching up with the issue. Uh, I think Richmond has been a leader in many areas, but not in this area. So I think we have seen the other cities have, may have been done more than we do. So uh, well, some of the recommendations here, I think, are long overdue. Uh, however, I think, um, well, of course, we can focus on ourselves. But I think we, can also, we should also look beyond ourselves and see what is happening in the community. May I ask the question that, uh, do we have any kind of platform or uh, um, organization in the community that are bring people together, different organizations, NGOs, and the city together to address these truth and reconciliation type issues. I don't seem to know that there's a group or a platform like that. Uh, I, I would have to defer to our community social development staff. I believe we do have an advisory committee that, um, that, that, that meets on diversity and um, uh, equity and also inclusion in our community, um, but I would have to defer to our, our staff to indicate which ex which uh, advisory committee that is. Through the chair to Councillor L, 
to your question, we did have a community table called the Indigenous Collaborative Table. It was composed of uh, the city and <clears throat> different community partners in Richmond to talk about um, working together with indigenous groups to foster and promote arts and culture and incorporating heritage practices. However, we did have um, a, cult a Muslim cultural advisor in Terry Point. Since he passed away, we have not um, gotten together um, because we there was no, no advisor that, was, that we could um, find to um, advise the group. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, to, to have a, a manager uh, for indigenous relations is, is good. But I think it's also important, if not more important, to have a task force as recommended uh, or m mentioned in the report. So I don't know how can the group that you mentioned, the advisory group, be linked to this uh, a committee or task force, uh, as mentioned in this report. So, how, can this advisory committee be converted into a task force, so that you know we can lead uh, the way of doing some of this work without waiting for a manager to be to be appointed? Through the chair to Councillor Al, it, it would be critical for the the position for the manager to be able to work with. Um, with First Nation groups and community groups um, uh, throughout Richmond in order to prepare for putting together a plan. Um, and, and that's what would, that's what the uh, manager would be bringing, subject matter expertise, not in the field, and also being able to liaise with um, other committees, other stakeholders, other partners in our community. And so certainly um, the manager would be bringing that expertise, and we would be working collaboratively with all of our community partners. So, Your Worship, in the short, I am saying that you know, we need the manager for Indigenous Relations, but we also need the task force or the committee. I think that's something we can, can consider more fully yeah. as the matter goes on. Yeah. This is just getting it started. From, that's from my point of view. Uh, Councillor Galanders. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for coming back with this report. Um, a lot of the councillors um, asked most of my questions. I just have a couple of things I want to clarify. So on page GP32, which shows the chart of what the other municipalities, um, what calls to action they've endorsed and what staff they have. So we've recognized that there are eight calls to action that we could do with existing resources. So it, if, we, if we endorse the work that we've done, then we could, like, if we redid the chart, then we would have eight, but we would have a dedicated staff resource as zero unless we hire the other person. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Gil Anders. Again, it's, it would be putting together a plan to address the calls to action, the eight calls to action. Um, some of them are uh, very technical, so it, would, it wouldn't include implementation of the um, of, of the calls to action itself. That will come at a later time okay. once the plan has been identified. But certainly a manager of Indigenous Relations can certainly identify what are the key priorities and what are the plans needed in order for us to advance any, all those calls to action that we identified. Okay, so the ones on the chart, they've already um, implemented the calls to action. Now through the chair to Councillor Gillanders, there are there they're in the process of working on those calls to action um, or they've been implemented, one of the two. And you're saying that in order for us to do any of these eight, we do have to hire the other person. So uh, we kind of have nothing without it. Through the chair to Councillor Gil Anders, um, if you look at, uh, uh, sorry, in attachment number four, um, you know, there's only a few. There's only a few items that we can address with existing resources. Um, all of the other um, items are going to are going to need uh, additional resources for us to, in order to plan and implement. Could could somebody be appointed as an acting staff person to, to start the work on it while we're looking for somebody if we choose to hire this other person? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Gil Anders. We have tried to do that uh, up to now. Um, we haven't been successful in, in doing so because it, it really does, the calls to action, it really needs 
Uh, it's it's extremely important that we're working with First Nation groups, yeah. that we're working with community partners in order to advance any of these. And um, and so, I mean, it's it would be a, that person, that role's full-time job to be able to make sure that we are um, liaising with the community and we are able to put together a plan that allows us to uh, progress truth and reconciliation. Okay, and just one final question. Um, so in GP33, the... Um, honoring culturally significant sites through public identification of historical men's and archaeological sites in consultation with the Musqueam. Um, so sites are protected under the Act. Is this even just something as simple as, you know, Mary Point tells the story about the Point family living at Gary Point just to have, like, a, a, a plaque up with a description that's endorsed that, with wording approved by Musqueam on the significance of the area. Like, that would have to go through all these other acts and hoops? Uh, th through the chair to Councillor Gillanders, th there's, there's really two parts to acknowledging um, uh, Indigenous sensitive areas, whether if they are uh, for historical purposes. One is for certainly for archaeological purposes, so for any projects that happen yeah. um, in our community. There are certain sensitivities around certain areas in Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, for those other areas that have been already um, identified, you know, we do have our community services department, parks, who and, and our heritage services area, who, um, who were signage is prominent in those areas. And... Um, part of this would be putting together a plan, part of the plan would be working with those departments to be able to identify, to be able to, how, would, how can we celebrate sites that have, been, have already been identified and any future sites that have been identified. Okay, so we, if we went forward and hired the person to implement the plan, doing these recognition areas is part of that. We're not waiting down the road for that one. It, it would be putting together a plan again. It would okay. be putting together a plan the implementation, that's going to be the next step. Okay. And that's com coming out. That's a long-term, that would be a long-term plan okay. that we would put together. Councillor Day. Thank you very much, Mayor Brody. I'm a little concerned about redundancy, about doing something that's already being done. And I'm looking at GP43. There's Metro Vancouver, which, of course, we're a member of, has um, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, employees uh, on this on this uh, file dealing with First Nations. and truth and reconciliation. And then I know that the tourism in Richmond is doing all kinds of great work to bring attention to the stories. And of course, the library and the cultural center are all mentioned in here as doing work as well. And I, I didn't know that we had an indigenous collaborative committee. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, I think what I'd like to see is something more along the lines of uh, councillor, the other councillors around the table have said is, is more of a collaborative or a, a, a task force or because if we've got 12 um, specific items to the municipality that we should try to address and we've already figured out how to do eight in-house so far, that only leaves four. I mean, are we envisioning this as a temporary position or like forever, like long term or what's your thoughts? Uh, through the chair to councillor day the the eight calls to action that we are have identified um, those are uh, those would need the um, to, to be planned by an additional resource manager of indigenous relations so we currently aren't we currently haven't um, actively looked at how we're going to further those calls to action there's 12 calls to action um, that include all levels of government, eight of them of which we've identified that the city can do if we have an additional resource. Um, and again, it, it's really um, important that we're working with all of those uh, other stakeholders, uh, First Nation groups and all of our other stakeholders in the community to make sure that we have a, a plan in place to be able to move forward. So, so that additional, so the manager would be coordinating all of that, coordinating with all of our other departments, coordinating with Tourism Richmond, coordinating with all of our other stakeholders to be able to put together a fulsome plan. Because right now we don't have that position. To, uh, and and, and the, we, what we're seeing is things happening. There's lots of things happening in our community but there isn't a, a city coordinated approach and, that, and that's what that um, manager would be bringing to the table, a court being able to coordinate, being able to put together a, a plan for Richmond. 
So is this a permanent position or is it a temporary position? Oh, uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, we're at, we would be asking for council to uh, uh, approve a position in, within the rate stabilization account, um, and we would bring for, for 2023 and 2024, we would bring forward uh, uh, through our additional levels um, program to be and ask for that position to be permanent. So it's permanent full time. It, it would be full. It would be a full time position. Uh, through 2023, and then we would need to come to council uh, for uh, to be put into the base budget for 2024. I, yeah, Go ahead. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I feel like when I look at the cities and, and all of these employees that have been hired, and I don't argue that you know the work needs to be done, but it seems like everyone's working in silos, and if we combined our efforts, we could be far more effective. And so I'm I'm not totally satisfied that we can accomplish what we want to accomplish by hiring this one person who works in this silo and then Metro Vancouver works in this silo and then we've got tourism and the um, indigenous co collaboration. Everyone's working in like a different part of the city and different part of Metro Vancouver and, and I, I would be more comfortable if this came back with a collaborative approach where we can learn from other cities that are having success. So I, I, I don't really, I don't have enough information to support the position today. But I think if we had a more fulsome report, and as Councillor McNulty pointed out, a little more information, then I, then I could move forward with it. So I, I you know, given that it's a permanent full-time position for you know a significant amount of money, I think we've got to make sure we get the best possible bang for our buck. So yeah, at this point, I'm just not quite comfortable with it. Thank you. From my point of view, I think that um you have to work in silos to a certain extent because you're dealing with different groups. So if someone's dealing with a Kaiquillum, there is a process for collaboration and mutual learning. But the fact is we've got to deal with the Musqueam group. So that, by that uh, description, that, that puts us into a silo. The other thing I'll mention is Metro Vancouver has 10 because they're dealing with well, I don't know, 10 to 15 different uh, First Nations groups. So, uh, Councillor Hobbs. Thank you, and through the Chair. Well, thanks for the report, uh, very thorough, and uh, I will be supporting it today. Uh, I would look forward to doing more than just receiving it for information and actually endorsing it, so uh, we'll see what happens with that later on. But I think why it's important, well, first of all, with staff and expense, I think everybody realizes that the city is very cognizant of that, and I think we're not overstaffed, and there are capacity issues with staff in different areas of the city. So just expecting somebody else to do it off the side of their desk is probably not efficient and probably won't get the job done, as well as uh, having somebody do it full time. So a position like this, I think, is critical for us to move forward with truth and reconciliation. And I think that part of that role is, yes, it could be called working in a silo, but as long as silos are communicating and the important part is building relationships with other governments, with other First Nation governments, and with other even non-governmental organizations. So relationships are the key, part of the key. So uh, hiring this position to move us forward and get the plan going so that we can implement uh, the items that we've identified in Truth and Reconciliation I, I think is crucial. So uh, not only will I be endorsing it, I hope we'll, or accepting it for information, I hope we'll be endorsing it so that we can move forward and get the position online. Thank you. All right. Councillor Liu. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through you to staff, thank you for this report. Um, you know, I, I agree with my colleagues. I think this is an important thing that we want to move forward with as a council. Um, I think to adequately address our commitment to truth and reconciliation and to give it the focus and attention that will achieve our truth and reconciliation goals, we need someone to help us with that. With saying that, um, you know, Councillor Al mentioned and a few other people have mentioned a task force, but I think we as a council need to workshop with this manager so that we're on page together on to what our goals are more specifically, I think, on what we're trying to achieve. So I think it would help us to be able to workshop with this person to have to have a bigger discussion around what it looks like to us as a council and how that fleshes out. And then um, my question is, though, 
The Four Seasons of Reconciliation Online Training. I know Councillor McNulty and I did that course. I, was it offered to the new councillors when they came on board this year? Um, uh, through the Chair of Council Lou, I will have to defer that to our human resources staff. I, okay. I don't know. Or if it can be re-offered to especially the new councillors that came on because I know some of us did take advantage of the opportunity when it came up a while ago. Yeah. Uh, through the Chair to Council Lou, yeah, we can offer it to the, uh, the new councillors. Okay, yeah. great. Cause you, you can take that as direction then. Yeah. The more, the more we do, the more we understand, the more we learn, the, the more we'll be on page to get on what our goals are to move forward with this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so on the motion... Uh, I su suggest we simply change the last few words. Instead of received for information, it be endorsed by council. So, moved. so, so that's moved and seconded. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, sorry? You, you have some comments? Yeah, just, yeah, some uh, Councillor Galanders. Yes, thank you. So by endorsing it, um, that means we, we're... Um, Ask, we're uh, endorsing the position that's required as well. Yes. Right? Great. Yes. Thank you. So, so long as it goes through council next week, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Day. Yeah. If we endorse the position, and uh, which is, sounds like that's what's on the table right now, can we do a review in, say, 12 months to make sure mm -hmm. that it is, you know, working out the way we think it's going to work out and potentially look at, I'd love the idea of, uh, uh, Council Lou pointed out, of having a workshop with the manager and I love the idea of everyone taking the Four um, Seasons course. So. Uh, we, we don't deal with workshops in Council. And secondly, the next step if would be to hire the person and then we can expect a work plan to see a work plan, right? That's correct. Okay, so that's what's next. All right, so I'll call the question then on the motion. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? That Oh, that is carried with Councillor Heat opposed? And Councillor Day. Okay. Sorry, and Councillor Day, were you opposed? Yes, I put that one. Okay, so with Councillor Heat and Councillor Day are opposed. Um, some move adjournment. Move adjournment. Okay, now the next meeting is finance, so we'll just get things adjusted. All right, we'll call the Finance Committee meeting to order. May I have a motion on the minutes? Okay. All those in favor, post carried. Um, then we have a presentation by KPMG on the audit findings. So you've got a short summary of some sort? Yeah, we'll, we'll provide a short summary. Um, I'm just here to introduce the team. Uh, CJ James, who's the lead audit engagement partner, is out of the country. So I'm the engagement quality control uh, review partner and thought I would uh, be here to ensure that you have the opportunity, if needed, to ask any questions of a partner at KPMG. But with me is Anu Adelaide, who's the senior manager on the account, and she'll cover some of the highlights. Okay. All right, is there anything you want to tell us? We've read the report through the report so it's just if you want to emphasize something or add something to it um, nothing really just wanted to say that we completed the audit um, we have a clean opinion meaning that um, we have an unqualified or unmodified opinion of the financial statements okay any qu questions of the delegation I move the report no we're not there yet thank you very much thank you we will excuse you we will excuse you Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that moves us to the consolidated financial statements. Uh, Cindy, is there anything to add to your report? Cindy, go follow. <laughs> Nothing to add. So that's moved and seconded. Any discussion, comments, questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, apparently, Susan Walters is not available. Uh, Sorry? Oh, she's on Zoom if there are any questions. Um, let's ask her. Uh, Susan, is there anything you want to add to your report? Nothing to add to my report, Mr. Oh. Chair. Okay. This is a recommendation, but is it only for information not approved? Um, Why wouldn't we approve their, their position? Um, asking staff, do, doesn't the 
the library board as oh, a separate right. entity hey, approve their financial? Yep. Uh, I'm getting nods here for okay. no one saying anything. But <laughs> yes. Let's move I, something. Yeah. I, can, I can respond to that. The library board approves the audited financial statements, yeah, which they did at the March 29th meeting. So we just bring it forward to you, Council, for information. Good. Thank you. Councilor Day. Yeah, thank you. I just had one question. Um, I see the uh, on page FIN 109 that the salaries and employee benefits uh, are the biggest expense at $8.3 million. How many employees work at the library? We have, a pro uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, we have approximately 95 regular full-time or regular employees, and then we have auxiliary employees on top of that that bring us to about 130 employees. I can't quite okay. hear. Did, did she say 95 full-time? Yes. Approximately 95 full-time employees and uh, about a, a 30 or so auxiliary employees. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so we'll call the question then on the motion. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? That's carried. Financial statements for Lulu Island Energy Company. Uh, we've got Alan Postolka. Jerry Chong is here for any questions. Is there anything you want to add to your report? Worship, I have nothing to add to the report. Okay. Someone want to move them? recommendation. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. And I need my second page. Okay, then we got the Richmond Olympic Oval Corporation, the audited financial statements. Uh, is Rick DeSange here? Rick? Uh, Rick, is there anything to add to your report? Nothing to add, Your Worship. Any comments or questions about this? Someone move them? Moved and seconded. Uh, Councillor Day. I just wanted to know, did um, the Oval receive any of the GOT funding? in 2022? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Day, uh, yes, that's correct. The uh, uh, city received, or the Oval received, $4.2 million. That's highlighted uh, on the Statement of Operations in 2022. Right. And what are the thoughts for 2023? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Day, the Oval applies for the funding each year, and we typically uh, don't find out usually until uh, closer to the end of the second quarter. Okay. Feeling pretty good about it? <laughs> Yeah, so, so the God the God contribution is on Fin one seventy one is set out there as part of the revenue. Uh, let's see. Anyone else, Councillor Galanders? Thank you, Your Worship. On Fin uh, one seventy one, the salaries and benefits for the Oval nine million seven fifty nine. Uh, just the same kind of question that Councillor Day asked about the library. How many employees approximately does the Oval have? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Galanders, the Oval has approximately 70 full-time staff and approximately 250 auxiliary staff on the books. Uh, that's not how many get paid each pay period, that's how many we have on the books. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And just to note that the 9,000 figure is the budget, it was actually 10-3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank but you. Same point. Yeah. Okay. Um, with that, we'll, uh, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Someone move adjournment. Thank you. Now we have uh, Councillor Liu is going to chair uh, community safety. Do you want to do it just from there? We'll turn on the, the mics and I can work all the mics from here. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Something like that. Thanks. Um, do you want me to call the store to uh, yes, it's okay. your meeting. Yeah. So I'll call to order the special community safety meeting of Monday, May 1st. Uh, I have a resolution here, remodular housing and related issues. The recommendation is whereas the city, Richmond City Council will need to address questions related to the lease of the Alderbridge modular housing project on city-owned land now set to expire in 2024. And there are many complex questions to investigate regarding this project and activities in the surrounding area. Therefore, be it resolved, staff investigate and report back to closed or open GP committee on matters related to Alter Bridge, including the range of housing options on the continuum, 
and whether other options may better support Alderbridge residents who wish to progress to other models of housing wherever located. Two, the effectiveness of the current operator of Alderbridge, the remaining length of the term of the lease, and statistics on the success of the recovery housing journey of past and present residents. Three, the adequacy, availability, and overall effectiveness of the supports for Alderbridge residents, and whether the approach to those residents with drug addiction is appropriate. B, RCMP and staff investigate and report statistics on calls for service from various departments during the tenure of the Alderbridge lease, including the amount and type of crime in the area, as well as a comparison with other communities with modular housing complexes similar to Alderbridge. C, Vancouver Coastal Health Medical Officer be invited to present an update including, one, the number of overdose deaths in Richmond, two, how the province is implementing the health care first approach after decriminalization of illicit drugs, and three, number of overdoses are occurring in residential homes compared to those on street or in modular housing. And I so move. One second now. One floor. Okay, and if I could just speak a little bit to it. Um, we passed a motion at, a referral at the previous community safety meeting. And our concern is we've been hearing from the neighborhood, from people in the neighborhood who are, who are concerned about various actions that are happening by people in the neighborhood. And we're trying to understand if it's coming from our supportive housing. We're trying to understand if, um, are we supporting people with the right continuum of care here in Richmond uh, and with appropriate support and treatment opportunities for those people? And are we contracting with the right providers who are actually able to be effective? Are people getting better or worse in our city owned facilities? And we need to better understand that. Um, it's been mentioned by someone else that transitional care is required for people who are ready to move forward in their treatments and that we don't necessarily have that. So for us, it's important to understand that. And I believe that we have metrics for our child care facilities and for our child care providers in our city owned child care facilities. And so I think we need similar metrics and reports for our supportive housing providers so that we're making sure that when we're, crea when we're creating supports and creating partnerships on city-owned land and we're partnering that we're doing more good than harm and that we're actually getting what we're hoping to and supporting the people appropriately. And so I hope people can support me on this one. And, and if it is adopted by committee, the previous uh, motion would be rescinded then? And the previous motion yeah. will, I'll rescind. Okay. So the next on the list is Councillor Heap. Yes. Uh, I've got uh, several issues with the motion that's uh, on the floor right now. And uh, I must start out by saying mental health issue, people that have these significant social order problems is significantly different from child care and I think we've got to keep that in context here so uh, the problem I have here is the world is facing a global mental health crisis we talk about the fact that we have uh, looking at the environment issue that we're ensuring that we have appropriate uh, flood mitigation in place we assure that we have uh, for example, a, a tree bylaw that's appropriate to ensure uh, that we don't have some of the significant issues we're facing. Well, this issue, in, in my mind, is absolutely significant. And uh, I think what we have here, in my opinion, we're going to face the nimbyism here in Richmond. It's going to be not in my backyard. When you look at the complaints, and I read the email that came on March 24th from the individual, uh, Steve Inuit, of the, uh, the hotel there, and I understand there was a meeting last week where not all of us were present, but, uh, you know, I was kind of uh, unfortunate that uh, not others could uh, uh, be there to talk about this or that it was dealt with in that fashion, so... We have to keep in mind, it's just not the Rain City housing project that's there. You've got the Richmond General Hospital that's there. You have the food bank that's there. You have the courts that are there. You have the coastal health facility that is nearby. There's so many uh, resources there to deal with people that are going through crisis in their lives right now. And I think uh, this, uh, this nimbyism and uh, one individual 
uh, conf confronted me at the gym the other day and, you know, went, went off on me on how we could do uh, things of this nature. So uh, I, I want to raise that issue because I can see the NIMBY being played out here, and I think we have to be very, very cognizant of that. If we're asking our staff to go in and do the work that's needed, we have to look at the overall aspect of dealing with uh, people that are in this crisis right now in Richmond and that whether we're appropriately dealing with it the way we should as a society here, the way we should representing the people of Richmond. Remember, we don't just represent people that are uh, own hotels or own uh, expensive housings and, and businesses. We also represent those people that are at the lower rung of the socioeconomic ladder that is uh, out there right now. The other issue I have is I don't understand why uh, it was uh, number C, uh, AC, where we're bringing in, or 3C, uh, Vancouver Coastal Medical Health Officer be invited to present on an update. They should be doing this on all of the issues that we're facing right now. I don't see why we're bringing them in specific to what I view as an issue of uh, this housing complex that uh, past councils uh, decided to go with. So I have a particular problem with this, and uh, the way this is presented to us, the way we are looking at this, I have some, some issues with it, and I, I can't approve uh, what the recommendations are right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The chair recognizes the mayor. Um, I, I, I agree that uh, we have to have a very broad look at, um, call it uh, community safety and all the related issues in our city center. But, but when we approved the modular housing, we, uh, we said it was short term, it was temporary, temporary in the sense of a five year lease. And so I think it's going to be a very complex set of questions um, going into 2024 when we talk about whether that should be renewed or not. I'm, I'm guessing that um, BC Housing will want to renew that lease. And so I think that it's time now that we can start looking on these more, uh, these, these kind of global issues in, in the area. Um, I do know that the, the VCH medical health officer be invited to present. That, that's a wider question than just from this particular uh, establishment. You know, talking about the healthcare first, the number of overdoses in residential homes compared to on the street or in the modular housing, and the number of overdose deaths, deaths in Richmond. So I think that that's a fairly general one. And I think that the, uh, I agree that Vancouver Coastal Health should be um, updating us on that situation, as should be the RCMP talking about services and uh, the statistics in, in the city center area. But I think that. Uh, the focus at the beginning is on, on the Alderbridge situation, the temporary modular housing. And I think that we need to start understanding the issue more, more generally in order that when the time comes in 2024 or maybe before, then we'll be able to have a, a broader view and be able to uh, come to conclusions from our own point of view. Uh, it's not going to be good enough to you know, a month before we have to to decide on a on a renewal of a lease, that we start looking at the situation. Then I think we should start looking at the overall situation now, and that will lead us into uh, next year. Those are my comments. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Councillor Day. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to ask. Uh, uh, hold on a second. We just turned you off there. Okay. I, I think I'm on. Yeah. yeah, you're on now. I'd like to ask our OIC about crime, because I think we've already asked the question B, um, that uh, RCMP and staff investigate and report statistics for service. 
And maybe I could ask the question again, because I, I believe at the time when we asked this question in safety committee, um, the OIC set, stated that any increase in crime is more to do with the, the density and the amount of people that live in the area and less to do with the modular housing. So can I be permitted to ask that question? Or? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Chief Superintendent, if you could come down and speak to us on this. Thank you. Uh, to, the, to the Chair, to uh, Councillor Day, uh, yes, those are some of the uh, contributing factors. Obviously, uh, you know, we have seen um, um, some trends, obviously, with decriminalization of illicit drugs and uh, uh, displacement of some uh, homeless encampments. So th there are individuals who, uh, I believe, uh, you know, have, may have moved into our, our area as well, but also, as uh, Councillor Heed mentioned, um, you know, there are other factors as well. There are, you know, courts, uh, other areas that uh, we have transit uh, hubs, we have shopping areas. Uh, it's, 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 it's a high density area which, uh, which um, um, allows for a greater amount of people to congregate, the more people going to that area, um, which, um, you know, uh, yeah, combined leads to, uh, to increased problems. That's what I thought you said when I asked the same question at the safety committee, I think a few months ago. So it's not that there's a, like a crime wave because of the modular housing. It's just that it's a lot of people are in the area. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, you're correct. And, uh, uh, and obviously, you know, again, what Councillor Heath mentioned, uh, you know, we are dealing with um, a significant... Um, a uh, number of our, our individuals' population who are facing mental health issues and addiction and homelessness issues. So um, as far as your police is concerned, um, there's always those proactive measures, enforcement measures, outreach measures, working with the communities, doing joint force operations. Um, however, um, you know, those are some of the issues that are still prevalent and, and, and they are there, which uh, results in an in increase of problems in those neighborhoods. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and then through the chair, I had a question of Ms. Somerville regarding uh, adequacy, availability, and overall effectiveness of, um, of um, the Alderbridge residents. In pr primarily, um, actually, more number one, the range of housing options um, that's on the continuum and whether the options better support residents. So if we didn't have the modular housing, would we have enough um, alternative housing to, to help all those people? Through your worship to Councillor Day, uh, supportive housing uh, is in the, on the continuum and serves an important uh, role for a number of individuals in our community because supportive housing provides a permanent type of housing for individuals that are in need of supports. So our supportive housing also offers 24 seven supports that help those individuals receive stability in their lives. So most individuals coming into supportive housing have either been homeless or have been at risk of homelessness a number of them may have mental health issues, they may have addiction issues. So the Housing First approach is in order to start dealing with somebody's health that has a number of issues and has also been at risk of homelessness or who has been homeless, is to have a roof over their head and to have that stability of having a home so that, that you can start to then work with those individuals to start to respond to some of the challenges that they have within their lives. And there's been a number of success stories with the supporting housing model uh, in our conversations with Rain City, who is the operator for Alderbridge. They have seen success with a number of those individuals. Um, Vancouver Coastal Health, which provides a lot of services to Alderbridge has said that that has helped to create a lot of stability with a number of those individuals. 
if we didn't have supportive housing, that those individuals would be transient and, and very likely on the street, which then creates other challenges within the community. And just a follow-up question. So the people who live in the modular housing units, from what I understand, aren't the problem. It's people who aren't housed that might be causing more problems. Is that right? Through your worship to Councillor Day, um, from our understanding, a lot of the challenges that are happening within the city centre are individuals that do not have a home. They're transient. Um, there's mental health issues that... Uh, a number of them may have. Um, they may be coming into our community. They uh, may not have the proper uh, supports to help them to deal with their issues. Uh, we do know that if there is a challenge with one of those residents, the operator is very quick to respond to whatever that issue is. Uh, the tenants that are uh, staying at Alderbridge also have to s sign an agreement, a good neighbor agreement, to ensure that they are upholding uh, to certain conditions that for their tenancy. So there's a real relationship there between the operator and the tenants uh, that's working well. When there are issues that we need to respond to, uh, Rain City has been very proactive and very responsive to any issues as they arise. Uh, just one last question on C, which is the medical health officer. Um, the only time we've really seen her is when she came to report on COVID. Um, are you in regular contact with the head um, health officer in charge of, like the, some of the questions, number of overdeaths in Richmond and implementing health care first, and no, the no, last one was how many overdoses in residential homes? Through your worship to Councillor Day, yes, we are in regular contact uh, with Vancouver Coastal Health. Particularly, I'm in regular contact with the Director for Mental Health and Substance Use uh, because her role is uh, very connected to those that are having challenges uh, within our community around mental health, addictions, homelessness. We are in contact usually multiple times a week. Okay. And, and just talking about and collaborating on what's happening within the community, what changes are happening. Uh, um, the director sits on our homelessness table. Um, also, um, there's a rep for uh, some of our other committees that sit on some of our advisory committees. But Vancouver Coastal Health is very responsive when there are uh, issues that are going on in the community. They also are part of Fox 80, so there's a mental health nurse and the RCMP officer that goes out and responds to, to challenges that are happening in the community as well. So maybe be possible in future reports to maybe quote some of those, like the director or the mental health officer, and, and just let us know about that communication. I think we've, we've, we've touched on it in previous reports, but maybe not to the detail that the council's looking for. Well, that's why we have this motion, is so that we can get the data. <coughs> okay. Uh, Councillor McNulty. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to support the, uh, this this motion. Uh, you know, the issue is that uh, this is a major step in the right direction. You know, we, we, we sit here, and, but there's a proliferation in uh, mental health issues in society today, and I think we've got to wake up to, a, to that fact. Everything from stress to economics to uh, uncertainty. And basically, um, there are people out there that are, have a cry for help. And um, these are issues that are coming out. And this is not a perfect uh, set of resolutions. Uh, I can pick holes in every one of them. But it's a step in the right direction. What's here is our issue as well as others' issue, okay? It's not us and they, it's we uh, as a community. Um, I, you know, I, I look at the alternative. If we don't examine what we've got, what is our alternative? What are you going to do with the 40 individuals in Alderbridge Way? What are you going to do with the individuals uh, up on Sexsmith Crescent? What are you going to do with the BC housing? And I'm going to comment about that at 2 and Bladell. Give them a tent and put them under the bridge? Because that's what's going to happen. These people are looking for areas to go with it. And I think as a basis of humanity, um, and we have to do what we can. We can't do everything, but we've got to do something. I think, um, to be quite frank with you, on, the, on these, um, 
uh, things, I think, with our operators and what have you. They're not perfect. They have a difficult job. But I think we need to demand more when we sign a contract with them. Okay? We're always looking for somebody else to take and deal with it as opposed to us. And I think uh, uh, there are some shortcomings. Um, there is some lack of uh, enforcement. Uh, BC Housing, for example, Tomb Blundell, um, I'm not going to tell, or the OIC can tell you what his men and women do outside there. We've got families in there with young children, and we have people, a blend of some, ho we're homeless, um, there's some addictive people, etc. and actions take place right in front of all of them, and they ask to do something, and the proprietor at BC Housing says, I won't call the RCMP. You have to call them. And by the time the RCMP get there, it's all over and it's done, and no fault of the RCMP. Our RCMP in Richmond do a good job, okay? And uh, on it. So um, I think that we have to go uh, and continue to provide stability here and uh, move on. We'll never be able to do enough. Uh, the fact is, is with modular, we were able to move very quickly. I mean, I, I think when we look at that module on Embridge Way, I watched them bring the first um, model in and put it down, and then I watched them bring in the second model in on the truck and back up to them, push it on. And it was actually quite interesting, and then put it all together and unpack it. And um, I think I wish we had more property that we could do uh, more with it. So um, the one thing I would ask, and... Um, um, uh, the RCMP give us call for service all the time, and we've got to read our safety reports. Read, read the last couple pages, it's already there, but I, I think it's good as part of this package. But I think the Vancouver Coastal Health could communicate more with the community. I'll be very frank with you. Um, and not only that, they need to communicate with the community so that we know that you don't ask that question because you already got the information. They can put out memos, too. Um, they, they can let us know what's going on, if it will help us. They, they can provide us with information. We want to work with them. So uh, I think the questions here are a step in the right direction, and I think we should go ahead with this. And this will always evolve. Um, like I said, we'll never get rid of it. Um, it'll always uh, uh, get it, but uh, um, I think... Uh, uh, we, we need to uh, uh, continue along this line step and take one step at a time and re redo it as, as, uh, as we, uh, we move along uh, because there may be opportunity for us to do others. So uh, with that, I'm going to support everything as it is, and then I would ask uh, for a timeline on some of this, to be quite frank. The only thing missing um, to uh, implement and uh, try to get the information um, as near as possible uh, to whenever we can. I don't know what the timeline is, but I don't. this needs to be an active document, not one to put on the shelf. That's all I have to say. Oh, to the chair. Thank you. Yes. So. Do you have a timeline, if I may, to you, uh, to the chair? No, we were hoping for the information as soon as possible. As soon as possible. That's good. If that can be recorded in the minutes. Councillor Al? Yes. Well, as a question in the motion are very good questions, and I think they're very timely for the fact that uh, the, uh, con the agreement is set to expire uh, in about a year. So I think we need this kind of information uh, ahead of time. And to some extent, I think this, this can be seen as an interim report or uh, uh, midterm report uh, on the uh, program. I think we have to ask these questions because in the beginning when we when council approved this project, you know, we have some goals. And I think we have to measure uh, the effectiveness of the program so far against the goals that we have been set. And um, as mentioned, this is a very complex situation. Uh, it's not easy. However, I also want to point out that um, the, we have to look at the effectiveness of the operator. Uh, I have questions about, like, um, how is the, the uh, implementation of the good neighbor agreements? You know, has this uh, operator ever um, let go of somebody because they did not comply with the agreement? They didn't, didn't follow the, 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 the promise they, that they make in terms of good behavior. And I also have a question about the uh, neighborhood 
steering committee. I don't know uh, how effective the committee has been uh, working. Um, do we have uh, minutes of copies of minutes of what has been discussed and how the issues have been addressed? And I also remember that um, um, when something happens and the neighbors complain, and the operator always said that, oh, this staff is new. So what is the turnover of the staff? You know, I, I did ch keep changing the this, this staff. So I think all these questions are important, and I think we need to know. But finally, I also want to point out that actually this is not about the residents in the in the uh, in the project. I think many of the problems caused in the neighborhood are by the people who are not living in this modern housing. So people from elsewhere, from outside, come to this area, and then they could create other problems as well. So I don't know how effective the operator has been, or what can they do in terms of you know the people coming in and from other areas and, and creating the problem. So I don't think we should blame the um, residents there, because many of the complaints and many of the problems are not caused by the residents, but from people coming in from elsewhere. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Hobbs. Thank you, and through the chair. Um, I'll be supporting uh, the recommendation before us today, and uh, many good points have been raised, and of course, we are at a crisis point for homelessness, addiction, poverty, mental illness, mental wellness. Uh, that's true, and it impacts uh, everybody, and nobody more so than the individuals that are facing those challenges. I think we do have an ability to help people who are in need, has been outlined, people at the you know, crisis point at lower ends of the socioeconomic uh, ladder, so, or ladder, so to speak. We do have a, an obligation to an extent and a duty of care without taking on roles that are clearly the responsibility for senior levels of government either. So, I mean, I, I will be supporting it, and primarily because uh, what it's really dealing with is, and I think the mayor outlined it quite well, is it's gathering information for a decision that we have pending coming up. This was temporary. There is an end to the lease, and so I think more information, whatever that information ends up uh, telling us, will be helpful when it comes time to make that decision. And so I'll be supporting it uh, uh, for those reasons. And I think it is important as well to guard against um, what is commonly called nimbyism. That's true. That's something that exists, and we do have to make difficult decisions as a council, and that's something we have to take into account, and we hear it on a fairly regular basis on a variety of issues, not just this issue. So, but in the end, this is asking for information that will help inform us and help us make a better decision. So I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gillanders. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay. I, I guess I'm, I don't have clarity on what this motion is replacing because the motion uh, two weeks ago at Community Safety is not in the minutes. There are no minutes, and it wasn't on the agenda two weeks ago. So I just said, would like to know what the difference is between the two. The motion that came up, if you open your community safety for next week, you'll see in the minutes. Oh, it'll be in next week's minutes. It's in next week, mi week's minutes. Because I was on this week's minutes. Yes, so that the motion was that staff investigate the range of housing continuum that would quote, better facilitate individuals who entered low barrier housing to graduate to other types of housing and leaving the neighborhood, potentially. Uh, request provider, to request providers of supportive housing to review their drug use policies in the room, in the rooms that people are using. Number three, investigate the efficacy of the operator at the Alder Bridgeway modular housing length of time left on that lease, statistics on the recovery housing journey of past residents. Four, investigate statistics on calls for services from various departments, including severity of crime in the area and comparison over time and with other similar communities with similar modular housing installed. Five, investigate whether other health care service enforcement can be provided to discourage these issues from escalating. And six, invite Vancouver Coastal Health Medical Officer to present an update on overdose deaths, how the province is implementing the health care first approach after decriminalization of illicit drugs and how many overdoses are occurring in residential homes compared to on the street or in modular housing and report back. And so, so this new motion is just also created by you and you just feel it's better, you've had more information, you just, it's just refined and 
I had some talk with staff to clarify it so that they had clearer direction on what they were trying to come back with. Okay. Um, I, yeah, and I, I'm okay with getting information. I think especially, you know, if we're getting complaints from people in the neighborhood, I think it's, it's okay to look like, you know, show that we're doing our due diligence and just investigating what's going on. Um, I definitely don't want to invite the NIMBYism either. I fully believe that we need this housing uh, there. I think we need another city center shelter, a 40 person shelter. I think that um, if we didn't have this place there, then people would be on the streets and they would still gather in the area, just as Councillor Heed said, because of the other services that are in the area. So I definitely completely support our temporary modular housing, but I'm not opposed to getting information. So. Thank you. Councillor Wolf. Uh, thank you uh, to, to the chair. Um, thank you for clarifying uh, all of uh, what was before and, and what we have now in front of us. Uh, I'm hesitant to, um, to what I feel is maybe duplicate uh, investigation um, for staff and for the RCMP to, to task them with this work. I, th I think they're already doing it when we ask them or when members of committee ask at community safety, we're able to get the answers. Um, perhaps having uh, a, a regular part of the report uh, that comes uh, from the RCMP briefing. Maybe that, that could be where this comes in. I, I just feel like it's gonna take away from the immense work that we need to, to have done by our staff, by our officers. Um, I understand that the, I was here on council when we had the, the temporary part approved. I think all of it is temporary. Uh, but not in the short term. We're, we're just climbing to this, up this hill uh, where many in the school system and who work with youth are saying we're going to have a huge wave of mental health uh, challenges in decades to come. Um, so I'm, I'm, and I'm aware of the, the value that the group um, has put in to, to work um, at, at monitoring the, the clients, uh, but I think it, it's a little bit short I feel like it's short-sighted to, to kind of maybe put them on the hot seat and, and, and say, you know, you know, we're not doing good enough, we're getting complaints. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, so the, the need for more uh, temporary uh, shelters like this is it's evident. Uh, I live in the part of Richmond furthest away from this, and all weekend long our community Facebook group, there was pictures and stories about people who were knocking people's doors and then taking their clothes off, who were sleeping in bushes and, and leaving um, the, the neighborhood at, at odds. There's no community police station out there. There's no uh, supportive housing. There's no access to food bank. And so you get an elevated uh, type of, of, of person when all they can get is from the neighborhood area. So it, I, I don't think this is addressing everything. I, I also support all that it's asking us to do. Um, I think I'm, I'm shocked really that we don't hear more from the medical health officer uh, in written memos or in person. So maybe that's a, a benefit here is we will call upon them to, to present updates or submit updates. Um, so yeah, that's some of my thoughts on this. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, people don't typically drop in and give us reports unless we invite them in to give said reports. That's why we're asking them, inviting our chief medical officer to give a report. That's why that's happening. Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think we really need to look at is what we have specifically the wrong solution in the right location. While supportive housing might be great, putting heavily addicted people in a space with not addicted people, are, is that making everybody fully addicted? Anecdotally, I've heard that many are actually worse. So we've heard that a couple of people have made it through and that's wonderful, that's awesome, that's what we wanted. But if we just made 35 people heavily addicted because now they're living with some addicted people, that's not what we wanted. That wasn't our goal. Yes, we need more housing and more things for people. Do we want more of the same? Or is there an opportunity to do better? And this is our opportunity to figure out 
what are the stats? What else is available out there? What else should we be doing? Should we be doing more of the same or do we need something different? Do we need a transitional housing? We just got an email from someone explaining to us that they thought we need transitional housing. I remembered getting a warning from somebody, an industry professional from the outset saying that this is a tricky situation, putting heavily addicted people in with not heavily addicted people. You know, there was a study back in the 1930s where they had uh, anti-social boys put in with social boys and they thought that the social boys would help them. Well, it turned out that it made the social boys less social. So is this what we're trying to get? Are we getting the results we're looking for? Is there a better system? I hope there can be because we're seeing a lot of trouble out there. We're seeing a lot of problems and we know that we need to do more. Do we need to do more of the same or do we need to do more of different? And we need to be holding people accountable differently for the work that they're doing. So uh, I'll call the question now. Oh, we sorry, Councillor Day. And to reminder, only members of the uh, safety committee are voting. Well, I think we should rethink that. But, um, it's a committee meeting. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about this motion because, and I thank the chair for reading the motion that we passed previously because they're almost the same. The only thing that this motion does is single out, and I keep reading Alderbridge residents, Alderbridge residents, and to me this feels really almost like a witch hunt. And, and I don't, if we could remove um, all of that, um, referral to Alderbridge. I mean, if we're going to study modular housing, then let's study all modular housing. Let's just not pick on this one, one complex. We've heard from the OIC that the, the residents in general are, are not causing problems as other people coming in. We've heard from the Somerville that, you know, there's many success stories. This just feels really heavy-handed, and we've already got a motion that was passed. I think we uh, tabled this and let the original motion stand. Councillor Galanders. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to comment on that, I actually prefer this wording to the original one, so I just want to clarify, because I don't, I think the, the first one had some awkward things in there, like about drug use in the rooms and stuff, which isn't relevant. Um, so I just want to clarify that if we voted this one down tonight, we then the original see. one stands. Correct. From two weeks ago, right? Correct. So I think... Personally, I think this one is better, but I do hear um, Councillor Day's concerned about singling out Alderbridge. But it is relating to the lease coming up, but we could potentially amend the wording to say um, uh, relating to modular housing projects in Richmond as opposed to just Alderbridge. Um, they could look at both of the places. Um, but if someone wants to, to make that amendment, I would support that. Um, and I just want to comment on... Um, on the chair's comments about putting heavily addicted people in with non-addicted people, and I and I completely agree with that. Um, I think that there's that low barrier housing is is low barrier housing, uh, but if people want to be in recovery and they don't want to be using drugs, um, sharing space with people who are using drugs is very problematic. And that's why we need more recovery centers. And we need more abstinence-based facilities so that people who want that can have that and they don't have to be with heavily addicted people. At the same time, we run into the challenge that not everybody that would use a temporary modular housing even has a drug problem at all. They might not want to be in recovery and they don't want to use drugs and they just need housing. So, I agree. Councilor Heath. You know, whatever information we can Get to make an informed decision I think is good but it's the correct information we need to get and understanding drug addiction understanding homelessness understanding mental health or the poly of all of that which leads to people in these low barrier housing is very very important I can tell you putting uh, you know people in with one other you really have to understand addiction before we ever get there so I agree in getting as much information as we can. I certainly disagree with trying to single out Rain City's housing in order to do that. And I mentioned all the other uh, resources around there to support people that are in this crisis right now. And if you look 
across all of North America within a two block area of the central business district, which we have here on number three road, if you can call that our central business district, you have an area similar to what we're experiencing here. Just look in Vancouver, look in Burnaby, look in New Westminster, look in Surrey. You have that within a two block area. And I gotta tell you, I think our uh, OIC is doing an incredible job from being socially responsible to deal with this particular problem, as is our staff that's dealing with this particular problem. So I'm for getting whatever information we can to make an informed decision, but I'm not for singling out this particular entity. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? You're not on the committee. Councillor Heed and the opposition. Uh, move we rescind the and previous we, motion. And now we move to rescind the previous motion from the last community safety meeting. Second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Move adjournment. Move adjournment. Thank you. We are adjourned.